Ladies and gentlemen, up next is the Land Development Panel. Please welcome to the stage our panelists and facilitator. Our facilitator, Dr. Pierce Jones, is director and founding member of the Program for Resource Efficient Communities at the University of Florida, where he administers the coordination, development, and delivery of educational programs on best management practices in the built environment. Ernie Cox is the president of Family Lands Remembered, LLC, a company focused on the conservation and enhancement of significant land, water, and agricultural resources through creative planning, partnerships, and sustainable development. Dr. Richard Levy is managing director of Levy Consulting, LLC. Richard is a senior executive with extensive experience in land development, economic development, master planning, and real estate investment strategy. Brian Kanan is president of Orlando-based Kanan Associates, an urban planning, landscape architecture, and architectural design firm. For over 40 years, Brian has created sustainable communities through the practice of urban design and creative placemaking. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the developer panel uh, on behalf of uh, Brian Kanan, Ernie Cox, and Richard Levy, and myself, Pierce Jones. I'd like to welcome you to this session. Um, the way this session is going to operate, uh, I'm going to offer some initial comments to describe the context of what I'd like to ask these guys. Um, and after that, they will each give a short overview of their current projects. Um, and I'll explain why their current projects are especially pertinent to this panel. And uh, after that, we'll go to some more specific questions that would um, be um, Questions that developers can answer, and it's the kind of thing that most of us don't know much about, is how this, uh, how this is really done, uh, how the sausage is actually made. So uh, after that, if we have um, uh, more time to uh, respond to questions that you all can send in, uh, please do send in those questions. Even if we can't get to them today, we might be able to get to them in the future. So with that, I'd like to uh, offer you some context on the slides that uh, I prepared. Uh, on this first slide, um, this is Oakland Park. It's in Winter Garden, Florida. And it's a project that I stumbled across so maybe 12, 15 years ago. It's on Lake Apopka. Um, interesting thing about it and why I put it up there is to show you the concept plan. Interesting thing about that plan, there was a lot of effort that went into creating that plan. Um, what you need to understand is that effort was all prior to the land even being purchased. Um, that was part of the development process. The land was um, secured, but it hadn't actually been purchased until details related to the permitting of the project went forward. Um, you can see the um, little parks that they showed on the left. They had went to that level of detail and uh, even went to this level of detail. The individual landscapes in different portions of the project were explicitly defined in terms of how much turf area there would be, shade trees, accent trees, and so forth, and not just for the lot in, in its entirety, but the front lot, the side yards, and the backyard, all separated. So there were multiple versions of this individual residential landscape plan that were all developed before the property was actually even purchased. Um, that's why these guys are here. Because once you purchase the land, once the initial approvals are more or less guaranteed, the development process actually starts. And this is what most of us then see. We see the land be cleared. Uh, and in many cases now, the land is completely cleared. And there on the lower left, once it's cleared, it's, it's contour mapped and graded for stormwater management purposes, areas that need to be built up. Uh, land is uh, identified on the project where you can uh, generally uh, acquire material to build up areas and then those become stormwater basins and the residents later don't think of those as lakes. We connect those areas that have been built up to those, those normally wet areas with stormwater infrastructure. And once that's done, roads are put in, infrastructure, uh, sewage, um, water lines, so forth, and sidewalks are put in. 
After that, lots are sold to builders, and then the builders build their homes. And very near the very end of the process of building the home, the landscaping comes in. And most typically in Florida, certainly in Central Florida, it's turf, uh, landscape dominated. And once it's done, you have a streetscape like, like you see on the streetscape, like you see on the lower right. Um, that landscape is on very compacted um, soil with no microbial activity, very sterile. And um, essentially that landscape has to be um, managed as a um, almost a hydroponic operation. You have to irrigate it and you have to fertilize it because all of the natural uh, uh, aspects of natural soil profiles that would help with those processes is not, not available. And I just included that last slide, of that last uh, picture showing the connection again between this built area and those natural areas, the wetland area and the stormwater basins. Any fertilizers that find their way into the street and into the storm drains, that's where they go. So there's a water quality question and then there's a water supply question and so forth. Well, the water supply question in Florida, we've been using water uh, in a profligate manner for many years. Uh, this slide, you might not be able to see it easily, but this is from 1950 to the year 2000. That's what that bar chart represents. So we have been very rapidly increasing water use in the state of Florida. The image on the right is uh, the desal plant in Tampa Bay. What we discovered uh, back when we thought desal was an answer, uh, but what we have since discovered is it's enormously expensive. Uh, and then you have to maintain it and management and finance it, and it's an enormously expensive enterprise to go towards ZSAL. So we have a strong incentive to go toward water conservation. And in central Florida, where we're located now, um, and where these projects that we're going to talk about are located, um, the C Central Florida Water Initiative has been underway for the last several years amongst the three major water management districts to come up with a common set of goals that all of the water utilities will implement uh, on the public supply of water. And this particular slide came out on September 30th of 2020, just a couple of weeks ago. This is part of the rulemaking uh, that is kind of the end game of the CFWI process. And you'll note that they're asking in this slide for that 100 gallons per person per day as essentially the goal that we're moving toward in water availability because we frankly can't keep withdrawing water at rates that we currently are uh, if we continue to develop and bring in additional population. So that, keep in mind that 100 um, gallons per person per day. And let me show you a little data. The, for, this is from uh, Orange County Utilities here in Central Florida. And the data that's on the left in that table tells you how much potable water, how much reclaimed water, and how much water is actually potable but goes out under to irrigation meters. All of that data is readily available, and you can see that it's a little over 300 gallons per day per household. Now, that's not the same number that I mentioned earlier, but across the entire territory for Orlando Utilities Commission, I'm sorry, for the uh, Orange County Utilities uh, Utility, <laughs> it is a utility, um, this is what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to, to, to adjust their water demand within their territory to meet the goals of the Central Florida Water Initiative, that 100 uh, gallons per day per person. And when we think about a new project, I'll show you on this next slide, this is a fairly new project uh, in East Orange County. And we can drill down and look at its water consumption. In that particular community, they're using 500 gallons per day per, per household. That is roughly equivalent to 220 gallons per person per day. So if we have recent projects being built in Central Florida and they're using more than twice the water that we should be using if we're going to stay in balance with the water in the aquifer and so forth, um, it gives you an idea of what the water utility is up against. And uh, in that context, we would like to think about how those development projects from the beginning, from the very beginnings of the design of the community and the purchase of the land uh, and everything, uh, and then the landscaping that the developer is proposing, is it consistent with where we need to be? And uh, the purpose of this panel is to talk to the guys 
that are actually doing all of the design work before that fluorescent sign goes up and you actually know something's happening. Because an awful lot of the decision making goes on in the very earliest stages of these development projects. And so we're fortunate to have three people here who can address how the sausage is made and whether or not we can actually build communities that use levels of water that we can tolerate without wrecking this wonderful aquifer that we have in Florida. Remember, we're one of the very few places in the world that has a, an aquifer like we do here in Florida, the Florida aquifer, um, and we need to protect it. So, um, Having said that, uh, as a context and introduction, uh, I'd like to uh, hand off uh, to Richard Levy to talk a little bit about the Sunbridge Project and uh, Richard. Pierce, thank you very much. Very quickly, the Sunbridge Project, uh, we'll show you a map in just a second, but it's a little over 27,000 acres. Uh, it's got a uh, planned number of residential units, about 36,000, um, single family to multifamily, uh, almost two to one, about 20 million square feet of planned uh, commercial and industrial space, some 5,500 hotel rooms. Uh, we'll build out at least uh, take 30, perhaps even longer, 40 years to build out at that size, and ultimately it'll have a resident population at build out to somewhere under 85,000 uh, 85, people. Uh, to give you some context, uh, you can see uh, downtown Orlando, the Orlando International Airport, some of the orange um, circles there. You can see the Lake Nona community. This is a Tavistock development uh, community. Uh, Lake Nona is a Tavistock development community and you can see uh, the two um, ends of Sunbridge, uh, the northern end uh, up on the beach line in, uh, in Orange County and then the southern end, the large 19, almost 20,000 acre piece in Osceola County. This is a project that's in uh, two counties, which is somewhat unique for Central Florida, not in Florida. There are some large master plan communities, as we know, that stretch over multiple, uh, uh, multiple counties, but this is uh, rather unique for, for Central Florida. And then uh, this is a little more context to show you the, the master plans, if you will, the high-level master plan for, for Sunbridge. And you can see large areas of conservation. And if you attended the session in the spring, the outside 2020 session in the spring, we talked a lot about the ecological communities and how the, the, the land plan is really centered on, on building within the context of those ecological communities and the chain of lakes there. And we'll get into a little more detail about what we're doing about water conservation as we go through the program. Okay. Okay, very good, Richard. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to move to the uh, Deering Park North project, which uh, Ernie Cox is responsible for. Ernie, would you like to talk about that, please? Yeah, this is a uh, pretty exciting project that's been in the works for probably the last 15, 15 to 20 years. Um, the, the specific project we're going to talk about today is a subset of a much larger piece of property that we'll talk about in a few minutes, but the uh, the Miami Corporation bought about 59,000 acres of land uh, back in 1924. Uh, it's located in uh, southern Volusia, northern Brevard County. Uh, when they bought the land, it was a cattle ranch. Interestingly enough, uh, they hired the University of Florida to give them some recommendations about what they should do. The recommendation at that time was to put it into timber. Uh, and so for the past uh, number of decades, it's been a commercial timber operation. Uh, and about 15 years ago, you started to see a lot of consolidation in the timber market mm -hmm. and the mills moving north, which meant that the timber industry in Florida was going to be less profitable. And so the company started looking at alternatives and went through a very detailed master planning project uh, known as the Farmton Local Plan. Uh, and on that 59,000 acres, the Farmton Local Plan uh, provided that about 70% of the land would be preserved forever in agriculture, mitigation banking, um, and conservation. And then the development would take place on the impacted forestry areas um, in a mixed-use fashion. So very similar to the Sunbridge concept, uh, similar to the concept of Babcock Ranch, um, of preserving the most ecologically valuable lands and then developing in the areas that had already been impacted in a sustainable fashion. Uh, and so total, um, uh, since that time, some lands have been added to it. So the total holdings now are almost 70,000 acres. Runs from New Smyrna Beach 
down to just north of Titusville. Uh, for those that are driving on I-95, it's that big empty area between New Smyrna Beach and Titusville on the west side of the road. Um, and then we're going to actually start the development activity in the city of Edgewater um, uh, on the western side of town uh, with a project that we call Deering Park North, uh, which is about five, a little over 5,000 acres. Uh, and some folks will know that as the restoration development of regional impact from many years ago. Brian was, was instrumental in putting together the master plan and the entitlements. Um, that project did not go forward. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to purchase that land and we've been working on, uh, on the planning and uh, uh, currently in the city of Edgewater to, to revise some of the master plan to more accurately reflect today's marketplace. Um, but some statistics that are important, 75% um, uh, of the land will be preserved. So 25% of the land will be used for development activities, 75% preserved. Uh, within that, a mix of residential units, multifamily, single family, uh, but also mixed use, uh, town square, uh, trying to connect a, a small town development um, in, in a larger context. Uh, and so we're pretty excited about it. One of the things relative today is uh, the work that we're doing with the University of Florida uh, and the Sustainable Floridian Certification Program uh, to look holistically at water use, at landscaping, at creating community, at pollinators, at, at uh, how do people interact with mm -hmm. nature, not just in the preserve areas, but also in the, the developed areas. And, and particularly, if anything, this. Uh, this COVID pandemic has taught us is that we need to spend a little bit more time outside. And uh, in order to do that, you've got to make sure those are inviting and, uh, and sustainable. So um, just to context on the picture, the, the area we'll be talking about in detail today is the pink area. Uh, that's a little over 5,000 acres. Uh, the rest of the project uh, runs about 23 miles long. Um, but to understand, 70,000 acres of property, over 50,000 acres of that 70,000 will never be developed. So very excited to be part of it and good to be with you today. Good deal. Thank you very much, Ernie. And uh, finally, I'd like to have um, Brian tell us um, a little bit about Sustany. Thank you, Pierce. Um, Sustany is uh, what we call an intentional nature-oriented planned community. Um, my client is uh, a gentleman by the name of Sean Freilich and uh, Colin Bauer Development. And we started out thinking about this project with a regional focus. Uh, that was important because this project uh, abuts the Econ Preserve and the river, and it's close to the university. So in this project, within four miles, there are 20,000 people working. So from a sustainable point of view, that gives us tremendous opportunities to be able to live and work close to, you know, close to home without extensive commutes. And we've actually got ideas where we can use electric micro mobility vehicles to um, go to the university and the research park from the site in about a 15 minute travel time. So this is exciting. Uh, some of the important features um, that we, we've um, been promoting in this project from day one is to think of it as a, what we call a five generation project, which means we're thinking this project will be sustainable over a 100 year plus period. Uh, that's important because it might build out in 12 years, but we've put in place mechanisms for this to be self-funding and continue um, through that long period of time. So that's a fund found a fundamental idea behind it. Um, the other thing that's that's sort of the essence of doing that is to uh, work with um, Pierce's university group to set up a Sustany Foundation. And that's the vehicle that will carry this forward over the long time with internal funding. And we're partnering with, um, with Pierce to figure out how we can be evaluating this project continually over its life and starting from day one to see how all of these ideas that we want to employ to be more sustainable can actually be built into the program and documented and measured as we go through time. So the, the Sustany Foundation is a very important part of that long five-generation plan that I talked about. 
uh, getting a little more specific, and I, we may have a slide for that, I don't know, Pierce. Well, that, that just shows you the 20,000 jobs around our site. Uh, and if we go, okay, that's the master plan as it presently exists. The engineering is yet to come, but this is about to be sent in for approval for a second round. Um, so let's see, um, within that project, there's a, an environmental core of about 100 acres that's going to be dedicated to the foundation and, the, and it'll be managed in partnership with Pierce's group at the university and our developer client. Uh, and it'll be a research ex experiment from day one. And it's very environmentally uh, organized around habitat creation, uh, integrating the resident population into the process of living in this type of nature-oriented community uh, that's a learning community. And that's the central focus of how we're approaching it is education. The, the core part of that idea is there's going to be on uh, day one, um, owned by the foundation, built by our client, a nature learning center. And that'll be the place we host all these programs like the Master Gardener program, the Master Naturalist program, and then have students come down from the university, live on site for a week, do research. It's going to be foundational to the whole project. Um, and I think just to close this part of the discussion, the challenge is builder programs that sell individual home sites to individual people. We can manage a lot of the other aspects, but the actual home sites we're focusing on a lot now. Mm -hmm. It's proven to be quite a challenge. We'll talk more about that. Okay. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's a good segue. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Um, we will now, um, uh, we're going to talk about a few specific questions that uh, we had discussed before we met together. And in fact, Brian, you're going to get to continue because okay. I had identified you for, to take the lead on this first question. Um, for the benefit of the audience, I'm going to read this. Um, uh, in an ideal world, truly sustainable landscapes would require little to no irrigation or fertilization. In the context of large master plan communities, practices that could move the total project towards sustainability might include use of compost as a soil amendment to rehabilitate soils after site work disturbance, residential landscape areas designed specifically to be non-irrigated, integration uh, or reestablishment of natural areas in community common areas. Um, now those are just three. But regarding those three, you know, what, to what degree are those practices feasible in your project? And I'm, I'm asking specifically in terms, I mean, there's a financial element to this. There's, uh, you need the yield of lots to generate the financial situation you need. I mean, we're not trying to break the bank, but do those practices seem like something that from the get-go you could integrate into the Sustany project? Or if not, what's the problem? Great question. It's foundational. And uh, reducing the dependence on irrigation and fertilizer, it seemed to me a smart thing to do would be to begin to triage it into some different topics, one of which is time frame. So there's an installation period, there's a maturity period, and then there's long-term maintenance. And the requirements are quite different, as we know. And so we're beginning to view the project that way. Uh, there are also different areas within the project. So for example, there are common areas. The common areas being uh, the parks, open space, and roadways. Uh, we have a lot of developer control potential on that. And we can control, to some degree, the homeowners association for, that'll be involved as well. So that, that's another level. Uh, by the way, there's going to be about 58% of open space preserved indefinitely on this project. Um, there's 25 miles of, of um, roadways, and you know that's also part of something we can actually manage and control rel relatively well. Then you get to the residential lots. So in the re there's 770 some acres of residential lots. Much tougher problem. There's about 140 acres of landscape on those lots, um, and we're going to have a builder program as l large master plan communities usually do which means we prepare the planning, we prepare the infrastructure, and then there's a sale to builders who have to sell it to homeowners. And that's where it gets a little more challenging. Um, so we, we've got a 
three or four strategies for, to approach that. Um, at the end of the day, we've got to change mindsets, but that's the last part of it. So one idea that can be done relatively quickly is to reduce setbacks. So for example, if we reduce the front setback on a home site from 25 to 15 feet, we save a lot of land, we bring the affordability down, which is a big deal these days, and that's about a 40% reduction in areas that need pesticides, fertilizer, and irrigation. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing we're exploring is uh, rear yards that aren't irrigated, maybe using bahia grass. Um, and probably, um, at the end of the day, there'll be a mix of these uses. It's not going to be one size fits all. Um, there might be some larger homes that are treated differently from some very small attainable housing. And we're going to have uh, currently 80 attainable housing units on this site, which are also part of the whole sustainability program. But I think at the end of the day, educating all the players to the potential of these alternate solutions takes demonstration. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have demonstration homes where these alternative landscapes and different irrigation systems are actually visible with the metrics that go with them to support it. So that's our approach. Okay, good, excellent. Ernie, you, have you know it's interesting, and, and uh, certainly we're all we're all interested in pushing the envelope with with uh, sustainability. The education component with uh, with people is a big deal, yeah. and and what I what I've seen and what I believe to be growing in popularity is the ability to to educate your homeowners before they buy, in terms of the the ethic of the community, the reasons that you're using the landscape material that you do, um, as part of the reason for wanting to live in the community. I think in many ways. It is a bit of a, uh, a self-fulfilling approach. And I'll, I'll use an example. Pierce, you and I were talking about this last week. I was at Babcock Ranch uh, last week. And uh, all of the common areas are covered in native ground cover um, as opposed to turf grass. Mm. Um, and the education from the moment you drive in, and it, it was actually pretty, I've got some great pictures of it, but the muley grass was in full bloom. Oh, good. And so you're driving in and it's just this spectacular um, meadow of muley grass and then a rain garden behind it as part of the stormwater system. Um, and then when you come into the sales center, that's the landscaping that's outside the sales center. Um, and so there is some turf grass. Mm -hmm. It's limited in, in location. It's strategic, but yet the landscaping that's used is consistently natives. Um, once it's established, doesn't need to be irrigated. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty exciting to see how you could start to do it. Um, there is a community buy-in. Um, and so uh, the, the, the average home buyer believes they're just looking for that yard of grass. Um, but yet when they see something that's attractive, that's different, they'll accept it. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting is you both have pointed out the dichotomy between common owned areas and private lands. And I think this is really where the rub is. I think as developers, we've advanced the management of common areas to, to really be able to manage water in a sustainable landscape fashion. In fact, a lot depends on how the governance structure of the community is set up. Now, we are fortunate, as is Babcock, to have an independent special district created by the legislature, which gives the governance of the structure some enormous powers in managing areas um, and control over delivery of services. Um, which may turn out to be fortuitous as we move in to try to get our hand, handle on how private lands are managed. But this is really the crux of the problem. I think we're, we've, we've moved the ball way down the field on common areas. I think the challenge is on, on the private lots. Very good. Um, I will note, it, note that, that the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program um, has um, you know, been around for a number of years. It's fully recognized, even by the legislature it was recognized. And in some communities um, where people, home, individual homeowners would then try to implement Florida-friendly landscapes, they were fought by the HOAs. And there's some astounding examples of, I mean, tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees 
for people that you know fought against their own homeowner association for the privilege of trying to do certain fairly modest uh, adjustments to their landscaping. So clearly, as you move from the common areas which you directly control to ultimately when you give up control of the HOAs, uh, that is going to be a challenge to make sure that that kind of resistance or or turn it around where it's the other way around, where if you want to get irrigation into expanded portions of your landscape, you know, you might be able to, presumably if this education works, right. that, that won't be so complicated to do. So the next question, uh, Ernie, I've got targeted for you, and um, uh, this one is for your mom, basically. <laughs> this is for your mom. Um, with respect to plant materials, how would you define sustainable landscapes and sustainable development for the state of Florida? And in your experience, are there key obstacles uh, and or objections to integrating more sustainable plant palettes into projects, landscapes? Interesting. And, and uh, Pierce, as you know, my, my mother's a, uh, a native plant expert. She served uh, for two years as the president of the Florida Native Plant Society. And um, she's a PhD ecologist from uh, Florida International University. So she works with me, thankfully, on projects and uh, actually works for my company. But the, f the first is inertia. We are, we are so used to communities full of grass that that's what we're used to. And then when we want to buy a new plant for our yard, we go to Home Depot and we buy what looks good and we bring it home. And... Uh, so that's that's probably the first is just this this we've been so used to doing this for so long we just do it, and second the places that we buy plants aren't necessarily attuned to t selling us something that uses less water. Um, so one of the things we've talked a lot about is that education of the homeowner when they come in, uh, but also the putting in of that landscaping to begin with. Um, an obstacle that, that I think we all need to recognize is it is more expensive to plant plants and ground cover initially than it is to just put grass, uh, if you think about that. So, so part of it is, okay, how do we start to look at lifestyle, life cycle costs of the land, plant material that we're using? Uh, so if it uses less water, well, that's less cost. Um, if it requires less maintenance, that's less cost. Um, and so you've got to start to build into those decisions, that life cycle um, decision. Um, the other thing is I like to try to use the plants that are growing there naturally because they're already there. And to the extent I've got plant material that's growing well in a particular climate, uh, how do I bring it in? And the other challenge that, that I think we've got to recognize, you, you mentioned it early, is that most of Florida that's being developed ends up being filled in order to make your stormwater system work. Well, typically the dirt that you're now piling up on top is the dirt that used to be mm -hmm. 10 feet underground where there are no microbes, there's no nutrients, and so you're bringing up sterile soil, you're putting it on the top, and then you're hoping for things to grow. Uh, and so we're starting to implement uh, a soil management program that basically says, listen, before we start, let's scrape that really good nutrient-rich soil on the top and put it over here for a little while. It means you have to move the material twice, so there's an expense. But then let's come in and put it in the compacted sterile soil under the roads and under the houses and the lots, and then let's bring some of that good soil back, put it back, mix it in, then plant our materials. Um, it takes a lot more thought, and, and there is, at the moment, an increased initial expense. Well, with regard to that increased initial expense, uh, that's also because those plant materials are not the production plant materials. You know, there are probably, what, 40 basic varieties of materials that are pretty typical, like you'd find at Home Depot, and that would typically be used, but what about that? What about access to the plant materials? I mean, if you decide tomorrow, Richard, that you wanted to do this. Delivery, right. where would you go to that's get great. these? That's a great point. <laughs> yeah, so that's another issue, I suppose. Yeah, we're actually thinking, I mean, interestingly enough, at, uh, at Deering Park, the Farmton Project, we've been growing pine trees for generations. Uh, we're actually looking at getting into the, uh, the business of growing some Plants. different plant materials yeah. on site. Right. Right. And, and Brian, you probably could chime in on this because you're doing, uh, re re doing your personal home. Yeah. And so what's your experience with availability of plant materials? Fighting with his HOA? <laughs> well, a, a, couple of, a couple of things I wanted to pick up on 
it's helpful, I think, to think about um, the way builders build houses. And it, they're big national builders. They build as a production line. Their budget for landscaping is actually very low. Mm -hmm. And they want to get a finished look at the closing. So those things don't fly very well in the face of what we're all talking about. And um, that I'm really focused on that. Um, and to your point, I've decided to take my own house and treat it as an experimental research project. So I'm tearing out 3,500 uh, square feet of sod and putting in every conceivable <laughs> potential new landscape material that might work well. And I'm going to document exactly what happens. So that's going to be part of the learning center and part of you know, sharing with people that you could conceive of this as an, e an evolutionary landscape. And you could enjoy seeing how the pollinators start to take over and how you have to handle the maintenance and how you, you're looking for an ultimate solution, not an immediate finished look. So that, those are a couple of things we're thinking about. Good, good, good. Well, let's, um, let's go to um, uh, Richard. Master managed landscapes are increasingly popular in master plan developments. And currently, the primary benefit seems to be that they're cost effective, uniform mowing and management. And I've, I've actually seen this where the mowers just go right down the landscapes. I mean, right. the front yards, yeah. they just don't even stop, right? And so there's an obvious economy of scale as opposed to doing one at a time. But um, do you see any opportunities for taking advantage of that master management landscape um, structure to foster more sustainable landscapes. I mean, does the fact that somebody's hiring and contracting with that company, does that give you, more like in the common areas, does that give you opportunities or does it just create a crisis? <laughs> well, I think the answer is yes and no. I think the, in theory, um, the, the ability to do that and manage private yards on a holistic basis brings some cost efficiency and some quality assurance potentially. But I think I want to go to what all of us know the purpose of private development is to build for a profit. Mm -hmm. And the success of master plan communities, large scale projects like we're all working on, usually depends on um, segmentation of the market, that we appeal to multiple segments of the market. Um, different demographic buyers at different points in time of their life, different family structures, we want to appeal, if we can sell homes to every one of those at the same time, we are going to be infinitely more profitable than if we just focus on active adult or young families. And the challenge we have, and I would ask Brian in his own, would he be tearing up the turf if he had young children in his household? That, I mean, that's a real question to ask. And so the challenge and why moving from managing sustainable landscapes and from the common areas to the private lands is that we go to the lifestyle. There's so many different choices. And it's very one size does not fit all. And pits, for example, in the rear yard. You yes. Know. Yeah. It's, very, it's very challenging. We all believe it's the holy grail, and we all want to get there, but there are lots of challenges. And anything that we would do to diminish our ability to sell to different segments of the market is not going to be viewed well on the pro forma. And so at the end of the day, if you're not profitable, you're not in business. Right. So we have to be profitable first and then figure out what can we do to move this ball down the field to try and get our arms around how to better manage those private um, mm -hmm. landscapes and making sure that they, they appeal to the widest possible folks. And to your point, HOAs, somebody may do an unbelievably beautiful, sustainable yard, but their neighbor may hate it. And so, you know, we got to get on top. We got to figure this formula out. Right. I don't know that it's been figured out. I know the first project in, in um, Sunbridge is a Dell Webb active adult community that has master managed landscapes. It's a, it's a demographic that kind of, you know, operates sort of in, in, in sort of a, 
um, a, a common way. I mean, they're all sort of at the point in their life where they don't want to have anything to do with the arts. It they don't even want to. Probably has lots of turf too. Right. It does have a lot of turf. Yeah. Right. But at least you know there 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 are examples of it happening. I don't know that it's happening in a sustainable fashion. Well, we had the experience. Um, of looking at water use in Toho Water Authority territory. And uh, the Florida Water Star program, uh, as implemented um, in, in that, by that utility, gave a lot of credit for not irrigating the backyard. Right. So a lot of builders opted to not irrigate the backyard. We found that the water savings on homes that were, where the landscape was managed nominally by the owner that there were tremendous savings. I can't remember, but it was upwards of 30% reduction in water. This is all potable, by the way. Mm -hmm. But we found that in the master managed landscapes, and of course this may involve the rental communities that they have around Disney. You know, there are a lot of rental, single family detached rental communities. Right. But those were, some of those were master managed landscapes, and we found that they were using more water. And um, Interesting. what we discovered when we drilled down was that they were never going to get a call complaining about the grass being too lush, but they sure as hell were going to get a call if it looked dry. And so their inclination was to just overwater. And the other part of that was that they were the lowest bidder, and so they, um, they were going as fast as they could, keep the price of the cost of labor down. They were not going to go into each one of those yards and, and adjust those, right. those timers on the irrigation system. Okay, that was the bad news. The good news is that once we realized that, you only had to go to the master management landscape company and, and tell them, no, 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 contract you will, and then it becomes part of the contract, and then you don't have to worry with all the individual landscapes. So, I guess we see the possibility of, and that was all turf landscapes, but you can manage turf to be less water demanding. Mm -hmm. if, and there are things like compost and whatnot that could be sure. added. But uh, so that was just, that was kind of what was behind my thinking when I asked that question. But uh, did, any thoughts? Well, well, you know, one other thing that fascinates me is, um, we don't talk a lot about it, is building a new ethos about this particular community because it is intentional in its design. And one of the things that was quite interesting when uh, we were all locked down at home and working from home with COVID was I'd be sitting in perfect weather in March on my backyard and I'd hear mowing and blowing, <laughs> mowing and blowing. I couldn't take calls, I had a friend inside. So I think you know there are a lot more people are gonna work and spend more time at home. And I think, um, Getting away from that sort of really basic way of treating maintenance can also motivate people to think about designing a little differently, I'm hoping. Yeah. You know, I'll pick up on Brian's comment, I'm laughing because uh, of course we've all been working from home and uh, as soon as I'm on a call and the, the blower comes by next door, uh, I actually am, am familiar that, uh, that one of our hospitals in North Florida, when they, up, when they redid their landscape contract, they required that the contractor use electric equipment because of course that equipment's becoming less expensive and, and more powerful. And so we're actually toying with the idea of requiring uh, any, any landscape contractor, maintenance contractor in the community has to use electric uh, for that very reason. Um, and then of course, if, if, if that can become part of your plan um, to reduce the noise, which <laughs> makes the community more livable and workable, yeah. um, well then you start to think about which tools do I really need for the plants that I'm taking care of. I, I yeah. will make one other point that I think is interesting. I live in, uh, in Jupiter, Florida in a community, a master plan community called Abacoa. And within Abacoa, and particularly my neighborhood, all of the common areas and all of the front yards are maintained by the HOA. Hmm. Uh, my backyard is maintained by me. Um, and at this stage of my life, my backyard is maintained by somebody that I pay to take care of the sure. backyard. I've, I've cut my share of grass. I'm not doing that anymore. But that may be a, a piece also that with a smaller front yard, mm. with a well-landscaped front yard, then it's master managed, um, you start to reduce that area. And I do agree that the life cycle of your families is important mm. because if I've got kids young kids or grandkids, I want grass for right. them to play in. Um, and so I just need to figure out how do, I, how do I help that grass grow best 
and use less water um, mm -hmm. through other techniques. Um, but it, it's a balance. I think it, as, we, as we work together to push the envelope in different communities and continue to communicate with each other, I think we'll be able to solve this problem. I agree. Well, like, you know, to your point, Ernie, the, uh, the front yard is, is sort of the showcase part, and it can be very dramatic and doesn't, take, doesn't have to take a lot of land or a lot of um, turf. The backyard could be the un unirrigated bahia where the dogs can run, the grandkids can run, and nobody really has to have it perfectly manicured. You know, so they can dig holes if they want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thinking of the kids and grandkids. <laughs> So the, related to this, um, uh, Brian, and you and I have had some conversations about this question, so, you, you know, but I, I want to ask, um, this is an experience that, I, again, that I've had up in north central Florida, to avoid higher public water supply costs. Uh, water intensive landscapes, both in common areas and individual residences, sometimes, well, I said often here, but uh, rely on m unmetered wells. Well, this, this is very typical in Alachua County. Unmonitored private wells make it difficult to establish meaningful community water budgets. So if I were to agree with you to, to meet some kind of a target, but everybody put in a private well, I wouldn't have any idea how it's actually being used. It's all coming from the Florida aquifer. So, so in master plan communities that choose to adopt sustainable landscape practices, uh, how should private wells be managed? Um, uh, should they be disallowed? And if so, how? Uh, if they are allowed, uh, how should water use be managed and monitored? So, I mean, I may be off on this, but it's my experience in chipping that the master plan communities do not irrigate with wells. Uh, we usually use a master stormwater system. But the interesting thing about that is the benefit of master plan communities to manage growth in Florida. Um, because the small individual lots and small subdivisions, that, that may be what they do. And they're not the, regulated that well. But the, the master plan communities are regulated pretty tightly with that regard, I think. And um, I think that's, that's really interesting because master plan communities 10, 15 years back were, were very much a state of the art. And then they became subdivision factories for large land builder guys. And they don't treat it as a master plan community as much as a resource for a lot of lots. So they probably need to be brought up to another level that the typical good master plan community like Sunbridge or Ernie's project would do. Um, and I think that's a long-term good answer to managing growth better in Florida relative to water is to encourage the large projects, but to set the bar high. Yeah. I think our, our experience has been the lands that we're developing are former ranch, uh, ranch lands, and so there are ag wells that are out there. Now, we're, we don't experience small individual wells, but large agricultural uh, wells, and they're often used as backup supply if, you, if reclaimed isn't available. Or the worst, you don't want to use potable for irrigation, obviously. Reclaim first, storm. You know, we're all after the one water holy grail of managing the water cycle on our individual properties. So um, from our experience, it's been the large leftover agricultural wells that developers, we want to hang on to the, the rights to those. You never want to give them up because they are, you know, the backup supply should you run into a serious drought and there's no reclaimed water. Um, and the dist water management districts do, I think, you know, are focused on that issue too. They'd love to get rid of those wells. So from our experience, it hasn't been the smaller wells, it's been the large agricultural wells that we tend to want to use as backup supply in cases of emergency. Hmm. Arnie, you have anything on this? No, my sense is, like, like Brian, the master plan communities are going to have a master system. Right. And the master system is going to be designed in such a way to minimize waste. It'll be designed to minimize usage. Um, and so we're just not seeing it in our, in our permitting and in our development that there's specific individual homeowner wells. Right. Um, and I like the idea of running separately metered systems. So you've got your potable use by home. And then you've got your either reclaimed or reclaimed supplemented with stormwater. 
Um, I think, again, uh, one, per one person's stormwater that needs to be gotten rid of is another person's irrigation water. Mm -hmm. um, and so back to the one water concept, that's also something that I think the public is hearing so much about water challenges that we all have an opportunity in educating our folks when they come to see the community of what we're doing about water uh, and, and taking what is a negative and turning it in to a positive in terms of, yes, we're going to ask you to use less water here, and this is why we're doing it, so that we can have this great place to, to live and raise our families. Yeah, perfect. So, um, Ernie, uh, as local and state governments and water utilities seek to encourage more sustainable landscape practices throughout the state, what approaches do you think would be most effective for them to achieve these goals with large-scale community developers? You know, it's interesting is that we're we're going through what I what I think is an exciting phase of development where we're starting to to first of all one of the things back to Brian's comment is that you're back to more master developers because your builders would prefer to just buy lots, uh, and so you've got your your master developers have an have an opportunity to create the place, and yes, we know the size lots that need to be made available, and we can do that. But the rest of the community, you know what? We'll, we'll create a great place for you to sell homes and build homes. Let's work together to get that done. Um, on the water side, uh, I'm a firm believer in, in, in carrots instead of sticks from a state and local government perspective. If we want a, de a community developer or a home builder or a homeowner to do something, let's make it worth their while to do so. Um, and so if we know it's going to cost a little bit more up front to put in uh, soil amendments or to manage your soil differently so you don't have to fertilize as much or uh, to use less irrigation water by having plants, you know what, give that owner, developer a break on a fee, uh, an application fee. Um, one of the things I find with, with uh, kind of pushing the envelope on sustainability is that a lot of our codes and rules and regulations outlaw those things. And so uh, instead of regulating more things, um, I'm a firm believer in working with the local government to provide some real incentives, whether regulatory incentives or financial incentives, to do things the way you'd like them to do it. Um, I think that's, that's something that we, we've been able to do it a little bit in transportation, uh, and I think we're getting better. I think we could do the same thing with water use and with landscaping. You know, there may be a lesson learned from energy conservation. 20 years ago, you can go buy an appliance and you would have no idea what kind of consumption would be on the appliance. But today, you can use your appliance based on energy consumption. I don't think we're dealing with that like water. And I think maybe we can learn from energy conservation and all the improvements and, and how, how somebody can buy um, an air conditioning unit, a refrigerator or whatever, and really understand that I, un I know long term I'm going to save money. Maybe we should learn from that mm -hmm. um, subject matter and, and apply it to water. And I, I don't know how that would happen, but there may be ways to going back to the education in teaching the buyer like they have an energy conservation in water consumption. Well, when Chris uh, was talking earlier in her presentation, she was talking about benchmarking. And one of the slides that I showed was uh, Orange County Utilities, mm -hmm. and also we have data from Orlando Utilities Commission and from Toho Water Authority. So. For example, in your project, I can tell you exactly what a typical home uh, and actually individual homes, what their consumption patterns are. And if you were to agree to hit a better target, um, you could use that in your marketing and your education of your homeowners as you're describing with the energy programs. Um, and that can all be readily documented. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're not just blowing smoke, you're actually able to hit those targets and the university can help you demonstrate that you've done that. That's, that's kind of what we would love to do, is to be in that position to demonstrate that you are hitting those energy conservation, those water conservation targets. So, Brian? Well, well you know, one thing that keeps going through my mind is um, <clears throat> if we can create a value proposition where these alternative landscapes actually add value. Mm -hmm. um, they can add value in a lot of ways, emotionally and, phys and uh, from a visual point of view, but also financially. So seeing is believing. So to the extent that we do control the landscape design on the infrastructure, 
the roadways, mm -hmm. the miles and miles of roadways, um, and the common areas. And we start right there with the alternative landscapes and they look good. Yeah. That's a big step. And then the next step is to transition down to my five uh, model home demonstration landscape front yards. Yeah. And then the buyer has a chance to begin to feel more comfortable making those decisions. That's where we're going yeah. right now. Good. So, uh, Richard, social perceptions and home buyer expectations for their landscape appearance is a powerful driver of demand. Um, are you seeing any shifts in buyers' expectations for the landscape and the role of sustainability and community design? I don't know that that's readily available information, right. but maybe. Right. Um, and what strategies would you suggest for encouraging a shift in social perceptions and home buyer expectations toward greater sustainability? Well, I, I think we've been talking all around that yes. all around yeah. that subject. Yeah. Brian's got some demonstration projects. Right. I've created this notion that if you know you have an app that you in real time can look at what your energy consumption is. Maybe we need an app in real time what your water consumption is and and cost. And yeah. so you know those are and maybe they exist. I, I'm not aware of them, but maybe they do. I I think, um, you know, it's interesting, we, you and I were talking the other day about uh, home buyers and their perception. And I think there is, and this is, um, this is just, um, um, you know, uh, a story. I have no data to support this, but it's just <laughs> what, I, what I've heard and seen in, in the marketplace. This is 2020, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my sense is that buyers in Florida do understand the water problem. I mean, we've been living with water issues the days of the week you can irrigate your yard. I mean, people for 10, 15 years, we've been, Floridians have been aware that there's a water problem. The press does a pretty good job of covering that. It's not a surprise. So educating, bringing that Florida buyer into a community, they have a base of information that perhaps the out-of-state buyer doesn't. The out-of-state buyer hasn't been dealing with Florida water problems, and so there's a bigger education effort, I think, there, and their perception of what, if they're coming here to retire, or they're coming here for a new job, their perception of what I'm going to get um, and what my home's going to look like, what my yard's going to look like, they may be in for a little bit of a shock um, as we move towards more sustainable landscapes. So I think uh, there is a dichotomy out there between the Florida buyer and the, and the out-of-state buyer. But the, the things we're, we're talking about are all the things that we can do to kind of move and advance this, mm -hmm. this topic so that we can get to the point where water management is top of mind every day um, because it has to be. I don't think we really have a choice. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. But there's a lot of heavy lifting, and I think what's useful is to try to figure out the incremental steps and the milestones that we might achieve that, that demonstrate results. I don't know how to do that yet, but I think you and I are going to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. We're all going to figure it out. Well, I, like, I mean, I like the idea, I mean, when we sat down, Pierce, and started talking about the Sustainable Floridian Certification Program, to actually have data that is shared on a community-wide basis of, A, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, better water management, less water use, uh, fewer miles in the car, uh, and to come up with some data that we're going to track and report and discuss. Well, those things, I think, work. People are competitive by nature. Once they know, they're, they're interested in doing it. And, and I do agree. It's going to be, Brian, it's going to be incremental. We're going to work our way through these things. And ultimately, part of our, our challenge and opportunity is to show the home buyer, the ultimate end user, that this is better. And uh, if, we, if we can do that and it's actually better, then we'll be successful. Uh, that's the only way in my mind I know how to do it. Well, you can influence behavior, and I think utilities are doing that with their pricing structure, their block structure of pricing on water consumption. And so you can, uh, people usually make decisions, the rational theory, they make decisions in their own best interest. And uh, the pocketbook is usually the place, the purse, the wallet is the place where, where decisions are made. And so it's a combination of all of these things that I think will drive us to the inevitable, which is much better better management of water as a resource. 
Um, yeah, I, this isn't uh, one of the questions, but um, I, w I want to be sure we get to it. One of the things that you've talked about uh, just briefly is to take um, some of the areas that will become common areas. So you're going from degraded, kind of pretty crappy pasture land is what you're dealing with. And you're talking about reestablishing natural areas. And I'm, I know that Patrick Bolan talked a lot about diversity of plant material, flora and fauna in the landscape. And um, I know that you're pretty excited about that. And I'm just curious about that, what you think. So from a social perceptions perspective, making that natural look an amenity and a benefit and a, and a value to community as opposed to yeah, I mean, to Richard's point, I think, Pierce, what, one of the big things that's an opportunity is social engagement. So we've got, um, in our case, we've got 50-foot wide upland buffers. I think we've got 18 miles of upland buffer. Mm. And, you know, I can envision where there are the naturalist garden, garden program and the naturalist uh, program that we're running, we're going to run, uh, people are actively engaged in going out in the field and doing these um, volunteer exercises on a regular basis where they're putting in different native plants, looking at the habitat results, monitoring that, getting educated by the people from your university. Uh, and that's building a culture that moves everybody in the right direction. That's, I think, one way we're going to be achieving results. Well, I can't tell by the sign that was just held up, but I think we're just about coming to an end. Is that right? When you say one minute, how much of one minute is left? <laughs> okay, wrap it up. All right. Well, then the last thing that we want to ask is just 50 years out, big projects, just your general perception of where things are headed. We won't be, I won't be here to see it, but... I know a young guy like you, Richard, you might, but... I'm planning on it. I'm not sure I'll make it. Okay. But 50 <laughs> years out, how important are these questions in that perspective? I think these are important questions today. I think this, the ability of these projects to get to 50 years from now are dependent on the decisions and, and choices that are made today. Okay. I'm assuming you two agree with that. Yeah, so. no, I'm, I mean, Pierce, I'm, I'm excited about it personally. The, the opportunity to work on a project, I mean, if you look at, at the Deering Park North piece, that's 20 years. Um, but if you look at the entire holdings, it's, it's 60 or 70 years. Um, uh, and so the opportunity to start laying those foundational pieces today, critical. And quite frankly, I think we can do a, a really good job. So do I. Um, yeah. And so I'm excited about it. Uh, the key also is look at how does that landscape going to evolve over time so that when 50 years from now, the small oak tree that I plant next year is going to have a three foot wide trunk and, and beautiful yeah. branches. I got to give it room. So no, I think, I think these conversations today are critical to the future of the state of Florida and the people that are gonna live here. Well, I'm gonna let that be the last word. Um, uh, Richard Levy, Ernie Cox, Brian Kanan, thank you all so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I, I gotta say, when I came into this, I was pretty nervous. I like to have a PowerPoint. I just want to go through my PowerPoint. Um, but uh, this has worked out much better than I had actually thought it would. Well, thank so, you. Thank you. Good to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll sign off there. Thank you all for participating.